Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at Grace Lutheran Church. My name is Landon Martin. I'm one of the pastors here. So if you are uh, joining us in person or online and have any questions about the ministry here at Grace or anything you hear, want to talk more about having a relationship with Jesus, I would love to have a conversation like that. Uh, This morning, I am blessed to be uh, leading and serving in worship along with our deacon intern, Dan Boer, and two of our elders, Jim and Vern, and Becky on the organ. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, First of all, if you have already been kind of mentally planning for Holy Week and Easter, uh, one of the Easter service times changed uh, just a little bit. So, Uh, please take note of that and make sure uh, everything's straight. It was something that we just kind of had up in the air because the the world is sort of unique right now, and I I think we've settled on a good schedule, so uh, please check that out. Um, I want to remind everyone that uh, Men of Grace, the Saturday morning Bible class, is meeting again. That's this coming Saturday morning, so uh, check that out, and there's more information in the bulletin insert. Uh, Bible classes uh, in general, uh, of course, are going on this morning. There are online options available for all of them. Uh, The adult class, we're stepping into uh, another section on uh, Revelation where we get a really neat picture of heaven and uh, kind of the reason, the rationale for the whole book. That's our uh, our theme today, so uh, hopefully if that interests you, you'll join me in there. Um, Today, as we begin this third week of Lent. We carry this Lenten theme of uh, repentance and uh, reflection forward as we see Jesus' clearing of the temple. This is a really iconic, famous account where He kind of chases out the money changers in the temple. It takes place on Monday of Holy Week, and so it's it's a more serious, heavier theme that we see, and we're going to talk about Uh, What may have motivated this? What was going on? What this has to do with you and I? How we can learn from this? And uh, ultimately, how do we stay focused uh, as people of Lent right now on the cross and the empty tomb on the other side? So that's our theme for this morning that you're going to see coming through in all kinds of ways in our service together. And with that said, I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of invocation.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Please kneel or be seated for a time of confession. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and from the salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer, here, offer their worship, and let us praise to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes throughout all earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set the tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man running his horse with joy. It is rising from the end of the heavens, and it is circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The just decrees of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are than gold. They, much, they are much finer than gold. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. He is very poor. Who can discern his errors? Let there be innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. And I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with permanent heart, with penitent hearts and steadfast faith, to embrace and hold fast 
the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. For the third Sunday in Lent is from the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. And the Lord God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I am the Lord, I am the Lord your God, a jealous God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not cover your covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from the first, St. Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, in, the, in the, chapter 1. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of his age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks demand, seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of God. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went to the, 
went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen, sheep, pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And in making a whip of the cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken us 40 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated to sing the hymn of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text comes from our gospel lesson, John chapter 2, but of course, especially these words of Jesus. You will destroy the temple, and I will build it again in three days. So far the text. Not too long ago, I read a story about uh, a man named Saru Khan. In 1986, Saru Khan was five years old, growing up in India. And on a certain day, he and his brother were out somewhere, and they needed to take the train home. They got off the train at a busy train station. They had to find their 
connecting ride on a different train, and they tried to work their way through the crowds to get to the train they needed to get to, but at a certain point they got separated. He's there with his brother, his older brother. His older brother can't find him. Older brother gets on the right train. Saru, five years old, gets on the wrong train. Starts searching around for his brother, can't find him. But he decides he's going to stay put, wait for his brother to find him. It's really late in the day. They had a long day. He falls asleep. He wakes up hundreds of miles from home. Well, the authorities at the train station tried their best to talk to him and kind of ascertain where he's from and what his name is and things like that. But he couldn't quite answer their questions. He knew what his house looked like. He didn't know the city he was from, for example. He didn't know any way to contact his family, and so the authorities did their best to contact authorities at other train stations and see what they could figure out. But communication between different jurisdictions was just not great at this time in India, and they weren't able to find the family. At a certain point, they gave up. Saru became a ward of the state and was adopted by a family in Australia. A loving family, a wonderful family, but for Saru, it wasn't quite home. It was never quite home. He never quite lost that sense of belonging that comes with being home. I think one of the things that grips us about a story like this is the concept of home, at least in an idealism, is something that's so important to us, because home means something. Home means acceptance, love, encouragement, usually a, a full belly, a place to rest. Home means everything good. It's the place where you recharge to go back out and meet the world. Home matters. I think that's an important concept for us to really understand and take to heart to fully realize what's going on in our text today. So just hang on to that. So when we jump into our text today, it is, as I've said earlier, it's Monday of Holy Week. So Jesus is under a stress and anxiety that we couldn't possibly imagine. And the accounts that we have of his, particularly his teachings, start to get heavier and darker as the cross gets closer and closer. And so today, we see a message just like that. And I think we need a little bit of context. So it's Passover week, which is the week for tourism in Jerusalem and especially at the temple. Jewish people would always make a goal, no matter where in the world they grew up, that one day they were going to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, spend a Passover in the temple, and, and experience it with the whole nation and all their brethren. And so you had people, every Passover, coming from all over the world that had saved their whole lives to make this trip. This particular Passover, there was probably about two million extra people in town for the Passover, so it was a busy place. And inside the temple, there were various merchants and money changers. So you need to know there was a temple tax to pay expenses on the temple that uh, adult males would have to pay every year around Passover time. It was equal to about two days' wages. And if you were in Jerusalem for the Passover, you would just pay it in person at the temple. Now, everywhere else in Jerusalem accepted maybe five or six different currencies at this time, but in the temple you had to pay a specific mandated type of currency because of its high silver content. And if you came to town and you didn't have that kind of currency, that's what the money changers were there for, to help you exchange out your money. But they charged a 50, 50% fee to exchange the money out. Now, to make this worse, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the temple, one, they exempted themselves from the temple tax, and two, they actually wrote down that this kind of fee structure of the money changers was completely fine and should be expected. It's rough. 
Now, a part of the experience, of course, for them would be making a sacrifice in person in the temple. That's a big deal. To be able to do that in the temple, to experience that, to draw closer to God, to have your sins forgiven, a huge deal. But to make a sacrifice, you would need an animal. You'd need cattle, a sheep, a dove, pigeon, something like that. Now, you could bring in an animal from anywhere, but it had to meet the standards that God set out to be spotless. Well, there were people whose job it was to inspect animals brought in from outside the temple gates to make sure they were spotless. And I'm sure it won't surprise you to hear, they almost always rejected everything that was brought before them. They always found something wrong with every sacrifice that was brought in from anywhere. And you had to pay them to evaluate the sacrifice that you brought. And once they rejected your animal that you brought, and they almost certainly would, you were out the money, and you were out the animal, and you still had to buy one somewhere inside the temple gates. Well, that's where the merchants come in. They'll sell you an animal. They'll sell you a a pigeon, a dove, a sheep, uh, any kind of cattle for any kind of offering you want to make. But, of course, They charged roughly 15 times the going rate for these animals. It wasn't always this way, though. The temple was built to be, meant to be God's house where He welcomed His people, where they heard the word of the Lord that would convict them and encourage them and remind them of His faithfulness where they could make their sacrifices and worship in peace with reverence. That's what the temple was meant to be. Now, originally, the money changers, the merchants, they were way off site at the Mount of Olives. But it didn't take very long for them to realize if they crept closer and closer to the temple, that was good for business. So they did that until finally they struck a deal to get right inside the temple gates. This kind of creep is something that's significant, I think, because we do it all the time. You know, the first time you say some words you shouldn't or you lose your cool, maybe you're a little embarrassed, but the seventh time, it's okay. You've been there. And it works like that with every kind of sin. The first time you steal something or don't show up or don't help out or forget mom and dad or covet something or spread the rumor, the first time you do it, it doesn't feel good. But the second time you do it, it feels a little bit better. And finally, at a certain point, It just starts to become who you are. And if we think about our lives, our bodies as the home, the temple of the Holy Spirit, if we start making who we are as this creep in sinful behavior, we start to push out, make the Holy Spirit unwelcome. And so, When we live lives like that, that consistently tempt us to sin, and sin snowballs and trips all over itself, we need to be welcome in God's house. We need the feeling of home in God's house. The people then, people today, we need to be forgiven. We we need to remember and hear that God loves us. We need to be called to repentance when necessary. We need to be understanding that we have to turn from our ways. We need to know that we need to echo the life, the example of Christ. We need these things. And Jesus, as our text opens, He sees this need being unmet. The temple is not serving the people anymore. You can imagine the smells, the sounds of the marketplace of the animals is making it pretty difficult to be in prayer to meditate on God's Word. It just can't happen. So Jesus, He's had enough. 
So he takes some ropes, and he winds them together, and he makes a whip, and he chases everyone out. All the merchants, all the money changers, all the cattle. He even calls for the merchants that were selling doves and pigeons in like wicker cages to carry them out. He got everything out of there. Imagine the kind of righteous anger that would have to roar out of him to clear a marketplace and people whose livelihood depended on them being there. Jesus knows that God's house is, spe- is important, specifically important, that we need to feel at home in God's house. He doesn't see it, and he clears it out. And then for one brief, beautiful moment, the temple can be the temple again. The market's gone, the money changers are gone, the clinkety-clack and the bartering and the smells, it's gone. And what's left is peace. Just think for a moment, right there in this moment, people that are young and old, rich and poor, local and from far off, they can pray. They can hear the word of the Lord. They can repent. They can offer sacrifices. They can worship. They can do all of these things again. God can get right back to serving His people in His house because there's peace. But it doesn't last long. The leaders of the temple, they come and they question Jesus. They say, uh, by whose authority can you do that? Now, just a, a, a small amount of background. There are some messianic savior kind of prophecies having to do with clearing out, cleansing the temple. They knew this. And so when they come up to him, essentially what they're saying is, if you did that, stopped our business that makes us millions, you had better be the savior. Give us a sign. Well, what he says You will destroy the temple, and I will build it again in three days. Now, he does something interesting here. This word he uses for temple, it's not the normal word for temple. It's kind of a a Jewish community slang word that was only used for a small period of time, and it specifically refers to the innermost parts of the temple, the holy place and the holy of holies. And so when Jesus says, you will destroy the temple, he's talking about the place where God lives and dwells and serves and meets his people. Now, if we just look at that scene for a moment, what Jesus is saying is, this is my house. This is my home. These are my people And I have to imagine as Jesus looks out and sees the crowd, sees the people gathered in the temple, he sees things that cut deep because he, as the Son of God, has lived and dwelled in the temple and served these people their entire lives. And so he sees maybe a family, and remembers fondly when they brought their firstborn to be named and dedicated to the Lord. He sees a a woman, and he remembers as she offered a sacrifice and smiled as the smoke wafted up and disappeared, knowing she was right with God and forgiven again. Jesus would see all of these beautiful moments of worship. Jesus would see all of these beautiful moments where he, as God in his house, met his people and served his people and claimed his people. And that's the source, that's the foundation of his anger is it's his house. But of course, at this exact moment, the place where God lives and dwells and serves and meets his people, it's him. 
It's his body right here. Jesus is predicting that the temple leadership are going to kill him. And just a few days later, just a few days later, he'll see them again at trial. And there, some will gather together and say, we heard him say, I will destroy the temple. Twist his words. The chief priest will say, have you no answer to make? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And when they do that and send him to the cross to die, they prove him right. But also, something beautiful happens. God is able to meet and serve his people through this sacrifice. So all of a sudden, in that sacrifice that they send him to, sins are forgiven. All the times that the sin creeps into your life and mine, our sins are forgiven. Even the money changers taking advantage of people, their sins are forgiven. All over the world, the sacrifice is made. God meets and serves His people in person. And ultimately what happens is that feeling of being home is something that goes with us. Because part of Jesus' death and Jesus' work is that Jesus will walk with us every day through everything, and everywhere we are, we're at home with Jesus, and He can serve us as His children. You know, Saru Khan, remember him? Twenty-six years passed by, and he stumbles onto Google Maps on his computer. He spends countless hours over months and months tracing the train tracks of the trip he took and trying to use the street view and remember anything he can about the home he grew up in and his neighborhood. And you know what? He finds a street, and he's quite sure that's the street where he grew up. He travels back to India. He goes to the street. He knocks on some doors. He finds his family. He gives his mom a hug. He greets his brothers. He sees his whole family, and they bring him in, and it's home again. It's love, and it's acceptance, and it's encouragement, and it's community. See, through the struggle, it's like home never left. And so for Jesus, he struggles on our behalf and makes his house a home for you. And so, just as he predicts, the temple leadership do destroy the temple of his body. And as they twist his words, he's proven right. But he was right about something else. He said in three days he will build it again, and in three days when he burst forth out of the tomb, well, the gates to your home were open forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which certainly surpasses understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ to life eternal. Amen. Please stand. Please join me in saying the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, our only begotten Son of God, begotten God, Father of the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, works awesome and salvation.
came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, Virgin Mary, and was made man and was crucified for the cross of the Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the, and he will come again glory and judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who the Father and the Son together is worshiped, glorified, who spoke of the prophets. I believe in the Holy Christian and Apostolic Church, one acknowledge one baptism under the mission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the Lamb of them. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, and the, for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this nation, for our cities and communities, leaders, military, who protect us, including Renee, Scott, Dan, Kevin, Rachel, Abby, Thomas, Jim, Tim, Jonathan, Paul, Chandler, Stephen, Randall, Chris, Sean, Stephen, Evan, Laith, Paul, and Nathan. For the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and for those who are caring for them, including Charlotte, Crystal, Frank, Alfreda, Patrice, Heather, Kathy, Don, Debbie, Ray, George, Linda, Donna, Nancy, Judy, Catherine, Lisa, Gil, Jane, Gary, Ina, Vinny, Cynthia, Derek, John, and Judy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Finally, for the faithful who gather at Concordia at the Triangle of God would hold close and lead them. For Dave, Gary, Travis, all the pastors they proclaim the knowledge of the truth. Let us pray to the Lord. For the family and friends of John, they would be comforted by the empty tomb and assured of the eternal life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. We give thanksgiving for the healthy birth of Amelia and ask for God would preserve her body and soul as we look forward to the blessings in baptism. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Finally, for all of those whose needs in body and soul are met, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, And our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Same way also he took the cup after supper. When he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. Now may this true body and true blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you steadfast in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace and joy. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord.